Chad Mosher. I'm a clinical psychologist licensed in Arizona and clinical director at Palo Verde Behavioral Health. For some of the kids who have depression anyway, I'll start with the more serious issues. Um, you're going to see a real increase in isolation, an increase, increase in pulling away from friendship circles. Uh, you're going to see a bit of an increase in some secrecy. And those folks, those adolescents who already have depression, who are also experiencing the pandemic, the stress of the pandemic, what we tend to see is a way increase in some of those behaviors in isolation. Um, wanting to isolate, keeping secrets. Um, we also see um, some irritability, an increase in inter irritability, specifically around school performance or around friendship groups. Um, what's typical that you might want to see in a, a regular old adolescent is a little bit of moodiness, a little bit of um, ir a little bit of irritability, maybe part of a day maybe a full day, nothing more than a week or two. So that's generally kind of the timeline we look for is if these actions and behaviors and maybe even isolation are happening for more than two weeks or per, like really persistent across those two weeks, um, that's usually a sign that something more serious is happening. So in, a, in the pandemic, kids who wouldn't come to us would just experience some a bit of stress, a bit of confusion, a bit of loneliness, um, really not being able to sometimes even identify what they're experiencing, even though they're experiencing a lot of distress and confusion, usually through talking it out with a parent or someone in their house or some friend groups. Um, people will, uh, adolescents who are a little bit healthier, just experiencing the stress of the, of the pandemic, will find ways of coping. It's the youth, the adolescents who are not finding those solutions and, uh, or, or their um, apathy is turned on, so their lack of really caring, their lack of motivation, um, those uh, youth you really want to pay a little bit more attention to, you want to focus a little bit on, and just to see if there's anything um, uh, worse going on. Um, <clears throat> some signs that there are some worse things going on, uh, suddenly wearing long sleeves or long pants, even in warm weather, uh, an inability to want to really show any um, part of their body, like arms or legs, um, those might be indications that there could be some self-harm going on or some sort of um, scratching or cutting or hurting themselves. You may also want to understand what their friendship circles have been like. Um, so if there's any distress in the friendship circle, you'll experience the stress um, displayed in your adolescent or if they're in need of some mental health resources, there's prolonged isolation, prolonged stress. So really it's, you know, little blips in the, the weather changes, but the climate is what you want to look for in adolescent behavior. Anything that's persistent, consistent over two weeks, that's a sign to really check something out. Um, so regular old behavior, um, your teenager gets in a fight with a friendship group or at school, <clears throat> thinks the teacher hates them, um, thinks all the teachers hate them, thinks their sports coach hates them. Maybe that goes away in a day. Maybe that gets changed in two days. Maybe you talk to them and they have other resources in their, in their mind that they can use. Someone with a serious mental health condition um, won't be able to bounce back from that or will hang on to those um, negative thoughts, negative feelings, and not know how to how to get rid of them. Um, other things like um, a little bit of uncleanliness or a little bit of messiness in the room, probably normal, um, abnormal, any rotting food, any like disgusting things in the room, any unclean clothes, dirty clothes that are just laying about and untaken care of, those are more signs of a little bit more serious dysregulation in their emotion or a little bit more depression. Um, motivation, 
it's typical for adolescents to experience just like fluctuations in motivation. Um, sometimes their motivation seems like they are highly energetic and highly achieving. Uh, and then maybe the next day they're not as much. What you want to look for is, is their motivation um, uh, consistent across time? So really it's consistency, persistency, look for that across time. Anything lasting more than two weeks is a danger sign. In a pandemic, absolutely expect irritability. Uh, expect uh, there is a lot of change that is confusing. There's um, uh, sometimes the ability, inability to really um, get out and do things. Um, the monotony, the, the, the difficulty of having to stay home or the difficulty of being online for most of the day can really um, create some irritability. And through talking in that irritability or about that irritability with the adolescent, they should be able to, to kind of turn it around at some point in the conversation or over a couple days. If that irritability is persistent and that irritability becomes um, defiant, becomes breaking things, becomes irritable to the point of irritating siblings constantly and consistently, to the point of grades slipping, to the point of fighting back with teachers or coaches, that's really when you want to step in and say, what's happening? And through a conversation with yourself and your, and your teen or um, find, find another trusted adult that you can talk with with your teen. Um, just to kind of make sure that there isn't anything more serious going on. It could be that they just are, are having a bad week and that bad week turns into a couple or a month. That's probably could be somewhat expected. But when that irritability is increasing and increasing and increasing and is persistent over time, there's something um, that needs to be checked out with their mental health. Um, other expectations in the pandemic, lots of schools have seen slips in grades. Uh, a slip in grade or a slip in motivation in school, not necessarily the biggest end of the world in terms of mental health or big indicators of mental health concerns. However, if you are concerned and they're not as concerned or they don't have any desire to show improvements, that's a different sign. And that sign could be mental health. That sign could, could mean something um, a little bit more serious in terms of their cognitive processing or their intellectual processing. I would just talk to the school officials, talk to everyone in that school team, uh, really get an understanding of what the options are for maybe testing and assessments and or advocacy um, uh, for different learning methods. Not everyone's doing well on Zoom and not everyone has been doing well with remote learning. And while people coming back to school programs, not everyone is picking up where they left off. So I think these, um, the stress of school performance uh, can really send us all into a panic when we see grades slipping and we think about the future of, of, our, of our youth. At the same time, I think um, gauging that many, many, many people across the world have been have been slipping in those performances because of this stressful, stressful, unprecedented amount of stress that we've had, and a change that we've had. Um, and I think that uh, being aware of what are your expectations of your your child's grades, what are your expectations about what their motivation is and interest is, and just kind of checking that in place for yourself too. Ask your other parent friends what they're experiencing with, with their youth and just check it out and see, is this normal? Is this not normal? How does this gauge with my peer groups or your children's peer groups? So I think Generally, what we see is the harder we push adolescents, the harder we really push anyone, um, the more intense our expectations are, the more likely it is that we'll see the same intensity with quote-unquote fun activities, which are usually party activities. So the harder you push in one direction, the harder they're going to they're gonna party it or unwind as it is. Like... In, the, in, an, in an opposite direction. Work hard, party hard, 
<laughs> um, that needs to be attended to in the programs itself. So if whether you're a sports group or a music or a theater group, if you have high intense expectations and you're demanding time or the time that you're asking for is very demanding and concentrated, that's fine. You also need to work in some debrief and, and de-escalation and, and just kind of chill zone so that they can also experience the um, unwind process together rather than finding it separately and getting into some other uh, activities that you may not want them involved in. Yeah. And when the message from the leaders is go have fun by yourselves, that often creates this intense dynamic of let's party hard as hard as we worked is as hard as we'll party and that can be dangerous at times um, i also think that um doling out the expectation isn't the isn't isn't unnecessary i mean it is necessary to have expectations and adolescents really do strive to work towards those expectations we also, in a pandemic or in a time when we're coming out of this pandemic, really need to pay attention to reinforcing and, and rewarding um, even the small steps that get people there. So congratulating themselves on making it to a practice, congratulating them for getting through a tough week, and just acknowledging it. It's not, it doesn't mean that you're um, opening up vulnerability and making people soft. It's that you're, it actually bolsters people to want to do more. So punitive expectations or expectations that have um, no reward system or the reward system is supposed to be we automatically feel good, those don't work as well. Um, we have to have a balance. Particularly for adolescents who struggle with what their motivations are. So if they are confused about what they... Um, what they want to do, or who they are, or what groups they want to belong to, adding the, the, the stress and expectation of high performance success uh, can really be a recipe for disaster for them. And, and that's exactly what we see. We see people becoming highly distressed over external reasons. Um, so I can't make the team, or I might get cut, or I've been injured too much. Those can often lead to, um, I'm a failure and I'm, I'm not worth anything. And those feelings can really get solidified and create some mental health concerns. Yeah, so some degree of secrecy is okay. I think adolescents are trying to form their identity and sometimes they don't want adults or parents to necessarily get involved in that. Um, a little bit of embarrassment might be okay or a little bit of um, dodging, uh, dodging direct questions. You probably can expect that. Even a bit of sassiness, a little bit of talking back um, when you're asking questions. And again, a little bit of irritability is, is expected in, during this time. What's not okay is if there's really persistent um, types of secrecy particularly if they're really unwilling to talk about any of their role in what's going on or if they're not willing to name different friends. The Bark app, um, I've heard, is a really good app to use to, to track and monitor some uh, online activities and discussions even. Um, I think some parents also feel very comfortable asking for their, uh, their teenagers' passwords to their Instagram or Facebook or sometimes even snap. The challenge in that is as quick as parents can come up with ways of monitoring, there are just as many ways of um, being unmonitored. And so I think adolescents, just, just making sure that your, your adolescent kid is, um, you know, you can expect a little squirreliness with that. But I think if they're continuously trying to avoid being monitored, there's probably something very serious going on. We've also seen the interesting um, dynamics with some social or uh, yeah social supports with with adolescents that they do monitor themselves too. So we sometimes in our therapy groups find that um, the youth in the groups will will check in on each other, and if there's something going wrong, they will usually bring it to an adult's attention pretty quickly, maybe our attention even, and then we can we can do something about that. Um, 
I think the normal, like, I don't want to talk about my dating or I don't want to talk about what's going on can be fairly normal. I also think that during a pandemic, if they're being secretive about who they're with, that's cause for concern, particularly with so much isolation going on. Again, adolescents are going to find very clever ways of figuring out how to um, get what they want and do what they want. Um, I think the more open conversations you can have with your adolescent, the better. Even if you still think they're somewhat lying or dodging, I think it's still a best practice to really be trying to be open and honest with your adolescent and creating a safe space for them to be able to tell you some hard things to hear. Um, most of the time, um, even with mental health concerns, they really don't want to bring those mental health concerns to the attention of the parents because they feel shame or guilt or are confused themselves about what they're experiencing. I think it would be um, somewhat expected to see a change in, for instance, adolescent boys usually need a lot more sleep than we give them credit for. Uh, and so we often label those kids lazy. Um, they're not lazy. They actually do require more sleep than we usually think that they need. Um, so the eight hours is a minimum. So if your adolescent is staying in bed, maybe in bed most of the day, might be a cause of concern, particularly if you come home and they're not necessarily wanting to hang out. That might be a sign of some additional isolation. Boredom can really create some problems for adolescents because then their, their creative thinking gets kicked in or their apathy kicks in and their motivation decreases. So having a little bit of structure, a little bit of expectation is okay. Um, in fact, it's, it's pretty healthy for us, um, particularly for adolescents who may have gone from a very structured situation in school to a very unstructured summer. So I think that f having some activities for them to do, um, getting rewards for those um, activities that they may don't want to do. So that might be chores, that might be cleaning their room, that might be sitting for their younger siblings, and really uh, paying attention to the positive activities that they are doing and rewarding them for that. The now what are different layers? So general, general therapy, um, I quite often use um, a, a site called psychologytoday.com. Uh, that will allow you to look up therapists um, and whether they um, work on specific issues and what insurances they take or what insurances they don't take. Um, that, that website allows you to search therapists, even some psychiatrists, um, and that could be a very beginning point of, well, let me try to get in to see someone. Those waits can be very long, um, They, not just for the, from the pandemic, but there's just a general lack of, um, we have more need in southern Arizona for mental health um, from adolescents than we have therapists. So I also think that um, seeing if some of the agencies in town, which I'll name in a minute, seeing if they may have groups, seeing if there are resources within your school counseling programs, um, maybe they have uh, short groups during the week that um, your adolescent can attend. It might be a depression group or an ADHD work group. Um, could be a variety of different things. Uh, those are some minimal ways to do this. Some of the agencies to contact, Pathways, uh, La Frontera, Intermountain. Uh, you can also call Palo Verde. Palo Verde Behavioral Health has both an inpatient and an outpatient program. I oversee the outpatient program and we have what's called intensive outpatient groups. So that's a little higher level of care than a once a week therapy with a therapist in the community or at school. We have therapy three times a week in a group setting for a total of nine hours a week. Um, it sounds intense, but what tends to happen is it's intense and short term. So we work very hard, very quickly to identify the concerns and provide some coping skills for each of those 
clients in the group. And there are other IOP or intensive outpatient programs throughout Southern Arizona. Sonora may have a few. Um, I think definitely at Palo Verde, we have a strong adolescent support team. And if we're not able to provide direct solutions, we can help find some therapists in town who are accepting new clients. It sounds intensive on the nine hours a week at Palo Verde or any other intensive outpatient program, but it's well worth it. I also think that the Palo Verde inpatient program is good when your adolescent uh, may not be able to be safe or is having reactions to medications um, or lack of medication. So they can be med monitored, um, they can participate in uh, activities and group therapies and receive some psychiatric care. Um, it doesn't mean that they're locked up. It means that they're safely attended to in a 24 hour setting. So different levels of care. I think the biggest issue in our community is just be patient and persistent. Sometimes it does take a moment um, to not only get that intake to, for, to be a new client, but to then access the services may take a little bit longer. So if you have any concerns whatsoever, just call and get an appointment. Even while you're waiting, during that waiting time, your child's behavior may shift. And then you can just cancel that appointment. Um, you may also ask to uh, be put on a list to be called if there's any cancellations to get your child in sooner. Um, maybe uh, those concerns are very uh, hard for you to understand and you're, it's difficult to wait, but it really is important to um, continue to monitor your kid's mental health. The other thing that can happen is you can get support for yourself too. If there are things that are absolutely out of your understanding or out of your scope as a parent, which is understandable, there's no shame to that. Um, no one gets a manual on how to parent, particularly if your child has any mental health concerns or learning issues or cognitive uh, differences than other, than other kids. Um, you may want to go find support for yourself and that might take a little less time than finding an adolescent therapist. Uh, what we know in the research is that if we as parents are solid, particularly if we need to, to bolster our communication among the adult network systems, um, among the fa and within the family, those communications um, trickle down and, and the, the youth will respond positively to those changes. So if you're finding that you're not um, enjoying the wait time and finding a therapist, which is understandable, finding some support for yourself in the meantime can also be a good thing. Yeah, if you've never entertained this world of inpatient stay, you probably have a lot of expectations that we can clear up right now. Um, one, everyone always comes in to get an assessment. Um, whenever there's an issue, come on in. The assessor is there. Uh, we can do that in person or also talk about the MAT team, the mobile assessment team uh, that can be um, called out to community or zoomed in for your kid. And uh, let's say that you come in, you get an assessment. That assessment is going to be looking for whether your adolescent meets criteria for the high level of care. So we are not in the business and the state of Arizona does not allow anyone to just get involuntarily placed in. There are many exceptions to that, but I want to reassure you that as a parent, you can bring your child in and get them assessed. Those assessors will absolutely determine what the course of action should be, whether they, they meet the criteria to be inpatient or outpatient. If they meet the criteria for inpatient, um, then they talk to you about the admission process. They walk you through those steps as a parent because they want to be able to work with you and you know your adolescent the best. So that information is going to be really helpful. There's certain clothing that's uh, um, important 
to keep in mind when your child is inpatient, so they're not going to have access to anything that can harm themselves uh, or strangulate themselves. They're, they're really restricted in the types of clothing and materials they have during their hospitalization. The other important thing to know is that the hospitalization process is highly structured. They're not allowed to be in their room for long durations of time unattended. Um, they're monitored every 15 minutes or sometimes less, depending on what the doctor prescribes. But a minimum of every 15 minutes they're monitored for their levels of activity and engagement, even through the night. Um, they're also um, surrounded by a behavioral health technician team and a nursing team and a social work team and a psychiatric team. They, this team all works with and for your adolescent towards their discharge. Um, most people will stay in the hospital six, seven days, um, sometimes less, sometimes more, depending on the situation and the severity of the mental health concern. The first priority of the team's inpatient um, work is to stabilize or make that situation safe for the adolescent. So perhaps they are feeling homicidal, suicidal. That's what brought them in. That's what you brought them in for. That one, we want to get that stabilized right away. You also will have a whole other set of eyes um, and monitoring these uh, your your kids, and not just solo, but also um, as they're interacting with other kids. So often. Um, support networks will be formed, uh, peer groups will be formed-ish, and there's a bit of reliance on one another, and that's a healthy, that's a, a expected and healthy reaction to being inpatient. The average day for the adolescent there is very structured. Up in the morning, everyone gets breakfast. There's activities until lunch. Everybody gets lunch. Um, unless there's a physical il uh, ailment or some sort of um, medication response that requires them to be sleeping, they're up and out of their room the whole time. Um, they're monitored, like I said earlier, they're monitored by several different types of professional people, um, from behavioral health technicians who are working the floor all the time, to nursing, to social work staff, and, and psychi psychiatry. They're monitored to see if they're responsive to the medications that'll help them with mental health concerns and um, and really monitored for safety the entire time they're there. So it's very structured, um, it's very thorough in treatment, it's not just sitting around talking to the psychiatrist, it's engagement in activity therapy, going outside, um, interacting with other youth, movie nights, it's very structured and um, it has some creative outlets in there too, activity and expressive arts outlets. You can call Palo Verde um, or the Crisis Response Center, and either way, we can also send out a mobile assessment team to uh, to a location and or to zoom in and do a remote assessment with you and your child. Um, those are really effective. Those mobile assessors can also really determine the course of action for your adolescent. Um, they can also provide some resources if needed, so perhaps they don't meet our criteria for admission, fine. Maybe they refer you to other outpatient resources that are less intense than Palo Verde's outpatient programming. Uh, maybe they have a referral list for, for therapists or psychiatrists, um, or just general activities for you to do with your, with your adolescent. So those mobile assessment teams can come right out to you, uh, either through video or through location at your location. And that includes schools too.